Welcome to the Family Beacon Podcast from Minnesota Family Council with hosts Grace Evans and Moses Bratchrude. Stay informed on the top stories on life, family, and religious freedom. Get the facts, stand for truth. Hello and welcome back to the Family Beacon Podcast. My name is Grace Evans and today I'm really excited about this episode. I am going to be giving you guys the facts so you can stand for truth, specifically in the pro-life movement. As you guys know, I am very, very passionate about the pro-life message, about this revolution that we're starting, and I think that there is no cause that is more worthy um, of us joining in and fighting for than the pro-life movement and the pro-life revolution. And so today I really wanted to dedicate this podcast episode to that topic. Moses, unfortunately, is not able to join me. Um, So when he told me I was doing the podcast episode alone today, I knew that I had to talk about pro-life activism because I feel like you and I haven't really been able to sit down, have a chat just about pro-life activism. We've talked about it so much before on the podcast, but we've never had a podcast episode dedicated to it. We've had episodes dedicated to the topic of abortion, to the topic of pro-life, to pro-life apologetics. But when it comes down to activism, I feel like that deserves a whole podcast episode of its own. So today, here's what we'll be talking about, you guys. We'll be talking about my personal personal story of how I became a pro-life activist. We're going to be talking about why your voice matters, why you should join this fight. Why is this fight more important than all the other fights? Um, We're going to do a little bit of pro-life apologetics 101 if we have time, although we do have other podcast episodes that you guys can reference and we will have linked in the description below if you'd like to. Um, I'd like to talk to you about some fast facts that you can always bring up when you're having a conversation with someone about the topic of abortion that you can just pull out of your back pocket. They're really good facts to reference, and I've compiled a list of, I think, five or six top five fast facts for you guys. We're going to talk about the importance of staying on message and also the role of compassion and truth. Then we'll discuss your next steps, how you can tangibly go out into your workforce, into your school, into your church, and take these steps of activism because you and I know that the preborn are worth fighting for with every breath we take. If we have time, I'm also going to be discussing a news story regarding our friends at Pro-Life Action Ministries and one of their um, prayer pro-life activists, their prayer support team activist members, um, actually getting talked to by the FBI when he was praying outside of a Planned Parenthood. So we'll see if we have time to get to that. But without further ado, I really want to jump into this topic of pro-life activism. What does it mean to be a pro-life activist and what's my story? I think I've shared a little bit about it before um, briefly on the podcast, but I don't know how in-depth I've gone. And um, here's what I want to tell you guys. There's a lot I could say, but for time's sake, here are the main things. I remember, you know, I've always been pro-life, so to speak. I I always considered myself pro-life. There was never a moment where I thought, oh, okay, I'm, you know, I'm pro-abortion or I'm personally pro-life, but I think everyone should have the right to choose. I That's not the case for me. I was born to a Christian home. We had pro-life beliefs. Um, it wasn't talked about a ton, to be honest. It was just assumed, like, we are pro-life. And I knew a few basic reasons. I mean, obviously, the baby is a human, so we shouldn't murder it. And obviously, the Bible talks about murder, and it's wrong. So that's kind of the extent of pro-life activism that I knew. Um, there wasn't a whole lot more to it. I remember I was in high school and I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, high school senior year was a really stressful time. I remember just being stressed about college decisions, stressed about major decisions, stressed about where to move, how my major, how my college would affect my future. I've always been someone who liked to have a plan and had a plan. But when I reached my senior year of college, my plan kind of changed. And I realized, okay, the plan that I'm going for may may not be God's plan. I'd always thought for the longest time that I was going to be a lawyer, an attorney, that I'd go to a school that would set me up really well for that. And then I'd go to law school. And uh, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do as a lawyer. I just knew that I wanted to do it. And people told me that I'd be good at it. And I loved speech, debate, all that sort of thing in high school. But um, I reached senior year, and that was the plan. I was planning to go to Hillsdale College in Michigan, which is a great conservative, private college, pretty expensive, but a great place to go. And I know it's just even get, gotten more popular since I've got, since I applied and got accepted. I, I know it's very uh, competitive now. It was competitive then, 
this was like four years ago, I think. It was very competitive then. I think they had like a 20% acceptance rate, but I know the acceptance rate has gone down even more. So I got accepted to that school, but I applied to a bunch of other private Christian schools. And I eventually realized through a lot of prayer and me just feeling anxious about signing on to going to that school. And by the way, I think it's a great school, but I realized that maybe being a lawyer wasn't necessarily the thing that I should go into. Maybe um, God had something else in store for me. And there's a lot of reasons I could get into that, which kind of plays into like my Christian testimony. But long story short, I was in this moment of confusion and trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I realized when I sat down and I like wrote out on a piece of paper, the person that I want to become and the, the things that I want to accomplish and what do I want to do for the rest of my life? I realized one thing. I realized I wanted to do something that mattered. I wanted to do something that impacted the world. I realized that probably like many of you, I could not be happy if I took a job that was, I guess, a job where I felt like I wasn't really changing lives. I wasn't changing hearts and minds. Like I wasn't fighting the good fight and being on the front line, so to speak. I'm someone who's always loved being in the fight. Um, so I thought, okay, there are a lot of injustices in this world. There are a lot of causes to join. There are a lot of things that I'm passionate about and that I believe strongly. And I, there was a lot of different things. Um, I thought about, you know, there's immigration, there's human trafficking, there's all these things that I could rise up and join that cause. But around that same time, I think it was January of my senior year. So it was January, 2019, um, New York City, lit up at skyscrapers in the colors of pink and blue to celebrate the fact that they had just legalized baby murder. They had just legalized abortion up until the moment of birth. Now, when I saw that news headline, I think I was scrolling through Instagram. I saw it. And you know, that moment where you just like, you have this kind of drop in your stomach and you feel queasy, like you're going to throw up. That's how I felt. Never before had I, in my very short life, had I been faced head-on with the stark reality of abortion and realized how prevalent it was and how many people actually thought it was okay that that late, in the third trimester, right up until the moment of birth. Um, that was what made me face the facts. And I think that's the very first thing I, got, I want you to realize is in my journey from, I would say, passivity, honestly, to pro-life advocacy... I had to be faced with the stark facts. I think that's something that all of us faced at some point in our life, in our career as a pro-life activist. If you're a pro-life activist, there was a time when you weren't very outspoken about your beliefs. You had your beliefs, but you weren't as outspoken. And then something switched. Something, a light went on in your brain. You had that moment of reality and the facts were forced in front of your eyes. And those triggered you to respond. And so for me, it was New York City lighting up their towers in baby colors in blue and pink and so I was horrified and so immediately after I saw that I realized I need to research this more because I just wasn't aware of how big of a problem this was I knew people got abortions but I was like okay I didn't know how often this was the case so I researched it I found live action which is a great organization one of my favorites absolutely they do an incredible pro-life work and I'm a huge fan of Lila Rose but I found Lila Rose I found live action I found all of their resources and their response videos responding to common pro-abortion talking points and I realized the more I researched the more convinced I became which is incredible like each argument that the pro-abortion side brought up, I was like, wow, it's just so blatantly wrong. Like, I didn't realize how easy it is to debunk these lies. Um, so shout out to Live Action and Lila Rose for their amazing resources and for her hard work. But I faced the facts and I began to find my passion because of other people that had laid the groundwork, other pro-life activists that had laid the groundwork for me, a young 17 year old at the time to come alongside and really find my why my passion my being um like why why was I put on this earth and what do I want to do with my life and so I realized okay this is the biggest human rights crisis of my generation and it disproportionately affects my generation I soon learned too as um as I like as I don't like to say but as I've said many times before one third of my generation is missing and so it is really up to you and I my generation to end this atrocity which isn't to say that other generations aren't important to this fight that aren't essential to this fight they absolutely are but every cause that wins that rises up that gains momentum has young people on their side and I think the reason for that 
is because young people are the future. We're the voice of the future. And we have this enthusiasm and drive that is often, it often sets us apart from different generations. Young people have that enthusiasm. We don't have cynicism yet often. And we just work go, go, go. And I think that's what's really important. And so I found my passion and I realized this is what I want to dedicate my life to. And then the question was how. And sometime maybe I'll talk more about college and decisions and things like that. I feel like that's a really helpful conversation to have, but I don't know how many young people are watching this and how interested you guys would be. Anyways, I found my passion and then I began using my gifts. And I remember I was hired on here at Minnesota Family Council many years ago now, I think like four years ago. Uh, This was right after I graduated from high school. I became their public policy intern. So very grateful to John Helmberger, their CEO, for reaching out and offering me that internship. It really catapulted me into a life of pro-life activism. And so I, I... interned in public policy, loved policy, loved the person I was interning for, our then policy director. And then uh, I kind of, over the years, I've gotten into communications here at Minnesota Family Council. I think I'm on like year two or three of communications and maybe two and a half years. And so I started this podcast with Moses, of course, and realized, okay, I love to speak. I love communicating things to people. And it's really is incredible that I am paid to talk about the pro-life movement and to advocate for the unborn. That is my job, and I love it so much. And so really, Minnesota Family Council was a huge blessing to me, came alongside me, mentored me. Honestly, without their help and their guidance and the mentors that have been placed in my life because of them, I wouldn't be where I am today without them. So Yeah, I started using my gifts. I also started, like, apart from MFC, I just started doing stuff on my own, uh, on my own social media platform, which grew pretty exponentially overnight. Um, When I started sharing about why women don't need Planned Parenthood and how Planned Parenthood actually really hurts women. Um, And that we just deserve so much better. We deserve healthcare centers that will offer us hope, compassion, and truth, not lies and euphemisms, and will only stand with us if we sacrifice our child. So that is my story in a nutshell. Again, it's a journey of passivity to pro-life activism. And Moses always says, you were never passive, Grace. And honestly, I I beg to defer because I think a lot of us are really passive because even if you know the truth and you believe the truth deep down, if you're not speaking up about it, you are pretty passive. I mean, this, here's what I want to tell you guys. We need to start acting like abortion is what it is. Our actions need to follow the truth about what abortion and if abortion is what it is the brutal murder of an innocent child that many americans support or think they support then you and i have an obligation to rise up so that's my story a lot of you probably have similar ones you face the facts you find your passion and then you use your gifts so find your why let's jump into um just this is what i always say when i'm talking to people about the pro-life message first and foremost we need to let our hearts break. Why? Because 2,363 children die every single day here in America um, due to abortion. 2,363. And that's the estimate based off of the numbers, the reports we have. We know in reality it's far more than that. Uh, Tragically, it's far more than that. But that's the numbers that we have. So at least over 2,000 children are ripped apart in their mother's womb, which should be the safest place for them. So we need our hearts to break. And I think unless you're faced with the facts like I was brutally, if unless you're faced with something like that and you have that jolt, it's not going to inspire you to activism. So face the facts and grieve for the unborn because they are worthy of life and they are deserving of our grief. Uh, next, I just want to talk to you briefly about why I need your voice in this movement, why this movement needs you specifically, because I think it can be easy to think, okay, well, you know, just like, why do, why does my voice matter? I'm one person. Like what kind of a change can I make? Um, here's the deal. If you care, you can make a difference because this is the biggest human rights crisis of our generation. I hear a lot of the time from people that follow me on social media or I meet in person at speaking events like, wow, I love what you do. I'm so grateful for what you do, but I just, I could never do what you do. And I, and I think to myself, 
you don't need to do what I do to make a difference and to change the world and to fight for the preborn. Like there are people out there that are so skilled artistically and I'm not. I mean, I know how to do a little bit of graphic design. That's part of my job, but I'm just not an artist. And some people are very good at that or some people are super talented at cooking or like there's so many things people are really good at and I'm not and I'm good at public speaking. I'm good at some other things, organization. Um, I have this optimism, but really when it comes down to it, I'm using my gifts to fight for the unborn. That doesn't mean that you have, that doesn't mean that your pro-life advocacy has to look like mine. In fact, it shouldn't look just like mine, unless you're just like me, but there's no people that are identical in our world, right? So I think it's really important for you to look around and to realize, okay, there are gifts that I have and these gifts I should be using to fight for the unborn. And that applies to just the Christian life in general and like the church. If you're a Christian, you should think, okay, I have gifts that other people don't have. And how can I use these gifts to serve the church? And one of the ways the church serves itself and the way that it can serve other people and the lost is through pro-life activism because we're called to care for the poor and the oppressed. And so if you care, you can make a difference. I am just, this is what I tell people all the time, especially students. Like, I am just a girl who cares. I am just a girl who is convinced that I am on the right side of history. So if you care, if you care like I do, if you care just as much as me or more than me, you can and will make a difference. Mark my words. Second, you need to remember that all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for us to do nothing. That is a quote from Edmund Burke. And it has stuck with me throughout my life ever since I read his book in which it is quoted. It's Reflections on the Revolutions in France. And he says, yeah, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for you and I to do nothing. And I think it's so accurate. I think if we just sit back and be passive passive Christians and passive pro-lifers, then evil will triumph. That's something that the opposition has going for them is that they never let up, they never rest, and they have, they, they just have this energy and they keep going. And that's not to say that we don't have it. I just think there are a lot of us, maybe some of you that are listening, that can do more, um, that just need that little push out the door to be, become pro-life activists. Finally, I've already touched on this, but we need your voice. And I'm speaking to young people right now because I know that there are young people listening or watching any successful cause must include you and I, because we are the future of America. We have the vigor, the enthusiasm. We have the drive to make it happen, to end this atrocity. Uh, so why join this fight? Why should you join this fight rather than any other fight? That's a question I get a lot. People are like, okay, Grace, I'm really glad you're fighting about this. But like, what have you done to end animal cruelty? What have you done to help the crisis at the border? What have you done to advocate for foster care reform? What have you done to fight against sex trafficking or to end homelessness or to fight against pornography? Like they ask me all these things and these are all causes that are very important to join. Uh, don't get me wrong. These are these are maybe the animal cruelty one. I shouldn't have said that's a super important one to join. But anyways, these are all causes that stir up people, the people, their causes for a reason anyways. But why should you join this fight, the pro-life movement fight? Here's what I have to say to you on that. First, there is no people group that is more oppressed than the pre-born in our entire world and in our entire nation. Now, not enough people fight for this cause because mainstream culture condemns the pro-life message, but it's an absolute fact that the pre-born are the most marginalized and the most oppressed. Um, there have been more people murdered through abortion than any genocide in history. If you look at the numbers, the numbers, I think, were over like 62 million at this point, which is insane and tragic, and I can't even fathom that number in my head. Um, so we need to rise up for them because they are the most oppressed. Uh, next, this you should join this fight because this fight is about basic human rights. And I've said this on the podcast before, but I will say it again. And th it's this. If we don't know what it means to be human, then we're not going to be able to have arguments or be able to define what it means to be a man or a woman. If we can't define what it means to be human, then we're not going to be able to tell people why human life matters and therefore, everything is now flowing of human life and the central truth about the sanctity of life and why it should be protected. If we can't get that straight in our society, we don't have a chance. We need to help people see what it means to be human and who is human and why humanity should be protected. Um, so, so this battle, again, is fundamentally about what it means to be human. So join me in helping others see what it means to be human. 
Finally, this battle is about America's future, which is why we must join this fight. America's future is being murdered in the womb. Our birth rates are devastatingly low, and literally our country is killing off future doctors, future moms, future dads, future lawyers, future scientists, future entrepreneurs. We're killing off the future of America, and more of us should be here today. Now I just want to transition, you guys, and talk to you about, I just want to transition into how you can win any argument about abortion, because it's really hard when you get caught up in the moment and you feel stressed out. Maybe maybe it's over DMs on Instagram. Maybe it's in person. But here are foolproof ways to always win the argument and to win the person, because ultimately we want to win the person. We don't just want to win the argument. Number one, always bring back the argument to the undeniable truth about the humanity of the preborn baby. This is called trotting out the toddler. So if someone's like, this is an argument I hear about hear a lot. Someone says to you, well, Grace, I think that your points are really good, but what about if there's, let's say, there's this child that we know would be born into poverty in a third world country, and he would barely have enough to eat, he would have a really hard life, like, it would just be super devastating, and his quality of life would be really low. Shouldn't we just abort that baby in the womb? Here's what you say. You bring it back to the undeniable humanity of the preborn baby. You say... Well, I'd like to ask you a question in response to that. What if you were in a third world country and you were visiting and you saw a toddler who was clearly starved? You could see ribs sticking out of his stomach, um, of his chest. You could see those ribs exposed. You could see him very clearly stunted in growth. You could see a hollowness in his eyes. Do you think it's better for us to euthanize that child than to allow him to continue to suffer in that way? And the person you're talking to 99.5% of the time. I've never met someone or talked to someone who wouldn't say this. They will say, no, of course we shouldn't kill that person. And and this is where you say, exactly. The preborn baby is equally valuable of life as the toddler. So here's what I propose that we do. I propose that you and I end the suffering. We fight to end the suffering this child may face, that these children do face. And we eliminate the suffering, but we do not eliminate the sufferer. And so I think it's a really important point. So always use that analogy, the trot out the toddler analogy is what it's called, because it helps to humanize the preborn. And again, that's our aim in this whole mission is humanize the preborn. And when we win on the life issue, we will win on other issues, undeniably. The next thing that you should do to win any argument about abortion is to call out red herrings. And I don't know about how many of you are classically educated or know what red herrings are, but I learned about it in high school when we were doing logic class and talking about fallacies. But red herrings is a type of fallacy, and a fallacy is a flaw in logical reasoning, but it is a type of fallacy that distracts you from the real question at hand. So a lot of times people will just bring up things that aren't actually related to the topic and they'll try to make you pivot from talking about the pre-born to talking about something else. So even the example I just gave about suffering in the world is, well, that's not really talking about abortion. It's talking about ending world suffering, world hunger. And while that's an important discussion to have, what we're talking about is if this pre-born child is human and if he or she is worthy of life. That's what we're talking about here. So don't be afraid to pivot back to what's actually at stake. The third thing that you can do as a pro-life activist to win any argument on abortion is to make the opposition explain and defend their position. So you make them explain to you what an abortion procedure is. So much of the time I find that when I say, okay, so you support abortion. What is abortion exactly? People turn to me and they don't know what it is. They're like, oh, well, it gets rid of extra tissue and then the pregnancy goes away. That's what most people say it is. But most people have no idea what abortion actually is or what it does to a woman. So make them explain your position, their position, excuse me, because when they repeat it back to you, they begin to see the flaws in their argumentation. They begin to see, okay, I'm actually inconsistent here. And that's when you win. So let them speak, let them talk, because until they figure out their flaws in their argument, they're not really going to be able to listen to you. So those are the three main points of how you can win any argument about abortion. Super helpful, super basic, and something I found really great over the past four years, just ways that I found to win arguments. Now I want to give you guys some fast facts for talking about this. Fast facts when you're in a conversation with someone or when you're texting someone about this issue and you just, you need a little oomph, okay? Here's five fast facts that I've compiled that are really helpful. 
Uh, first one is 96% of liberal, pro-choice, and non-religious biologists agree life begins at conception. And I think that's a really important point to remember. I mean, 96% of biologists agree upon this. And it's not like a poll, oh, it's done by a private Christian university, blah, blah, blah. This was done by the University of Chicago, okay? Not right-leaning, not conservative, not religious, not a... So when people say, oh, we just don't know when life begins. Oh, we just don't know. You say, actually, it's a scientific fact. We know that life begins at conception. And then they have to argue if that life is worth protecting or not. But establish that it's a life. The second fast fact I have for you is from the moment of conception, a baby has DNA that is unique from its mother's. And I say this because... A lot of times people will get hung up on the idea that somehow because the baby is with inside a woman, therefore the baby is a part of the woman. It's like it is her body rather than a separate unique body. Well, that would mean that if a woman is pregnant, that she would have two hands, two feet, 20 fingers, 20 toes, and two unique sets of different unique sets of DNA, which is not the case at all, right? Like, that's not the woman's DNA. A woman doesn't have two sets of DNA. A woman does not have four sets of feet, right? No, it's actually a separate child that is within her. And from the moment of conception, that DNA is 100% unique. Um, Maybe those feet aren't fully formed yet, but when conception happens, the DNA is completely formed. The third fast fact for you guys is that the U.S. Constitution protects every citizen's right to life. Um, our country upholds every citizen's, citizen's right to life. Thus, abortion is not constitutional. It's not American. It doesn't flow from any of our values. The fourth fast fact I've already touched on, but it puts this into perspective because sometimes people will say, well, abortion happens, but no one really wants an abortion, and it doesn't really happen that much. A lot of the times people will say that. Well, actually, 2,363 children, actually more than that, die every single day to to abortion. So this is happening on a very large scale, and I think that's important to put this into perspective. Okay, so the final fact for you guys is, the fast fact, I should say, is that at just 22 days, a baby's heart begins to beat. And the reason that is so important is because it illustrates the fact that this is a baby we're talking about. And the fact that it begins to beat at just 22 days shocks a lot of people that are pro-abortion. And I think it's a beautiful truth that just reminds you of the humanity of the pre-born. It humanizes them. And so... Uh, you can't detect it on an ultrasound. You can't detect that heartbeat until about five or six weeks. So if you have a friend who's pregnant or something and they go in, they're not going to be able to hear it until they're a little farther along, but it does begin to be at 22 days. All right, let's talk quickly about how to stay on message, why it's important to stay on message when you're in a conversation, because I think that's the number one mistake people make when they're just starting out in the fight for life. They don't stay on message and they lose the argument because of that. So Everyone has the power to change hearts and minds on the issue, but you can only do that if you stay on message. So here are some ways in which you can stay on message if someone's getting you off topic. Again, if they're pulling a red herring and they're trying to bring up something that's not really what you're talking about, here's what you do. Or let's say if someone is trying to get you to talk about something that like wouldn't really help get your message out, or um, I'm trying to think of another example. If someone's trying to trip you up and make you sh- make it seem like you're a hypocrite, especially if you're like doing an interview with the press, I've done them before and sometimes the press is really hostile and they're trying to make you look bad. Just remember, if you're talking to a journalist or if you're even talking to just a person and just a regular person, just remember that it's your job to show the humanity of the preborn and to stick to that truth. It's not your job to debate them on foreign policy about immigration or about how to end third how to end hunger, worldwide hunger. That's not your job, right? You can have those conversations, but not when you're having the conversation about abortion, right? And you're not even an expert on that. So stick to the topic. Here's how you pivot. So if someone's trying to corner you and get you to talk about something you don't want to talk about or you shouldn't be talking about, here's what you do. You use a pivot phrase. A pivot phrase is something like, um, here's the real question. So if someone asks you a question, you say, here's the real question, especially if you're doing like a radio interview it's a really good one because sometimes they'll be like they'll they'll ask you something that's not good like uh so why do you just why are you just so against women you're not going to answer that question right you're going to say here's the real question you know and then you pivot and you ask a question that's a lot better like um do you know about how um does does your audience know about how Planned Parenthood lies to women like that could be a good pivot 
Uh, you don't just do that, though. You can do a lot of different pivots. You can say, here's the main point, or here's what we really need to talk about, or here's what your audience really needs to know, or if you're talking to someone specifically, here's what you need to, do, to know, or here's the truth, or here's the bottom line. Phrases like that are really helpful when you're in an interview or when you're talking to someone because it helps you just get to the bottom of things and be like, okay, here's the bottom line, here's what we're talking about, or here's what really matters, um, here's what's at stake. The next thing I want to talk to you guys briefly about is compassion, the role of compassion in this movement. It's so important to be compassionate because the truth is on our side. We've got science, we've got God, we've got life, we've got basic human rights on our side, we've got so much on our side. But even if the truth is on our side and we don't have compassion, we're likely going to fail to win the person's heart even if we win the argument. So the goal is never just, okay, let's win the argument. Like, can I be the most winsome? Can I be the most well-outspoken person? Blah, blah, blah. Can I have all the facts? Can I speak it perfectly? Can I can I just like blurt it all out and get it all out there? And I've said everything as well as I could possibly say it, boom. No, that's not really the goal. Like, of course you want to be well-spoken. Of course you want to be winsome. But if you don't care about the person's heart, then you're not going to win the argument. So basically, if they, if the person you're talking to who is pro-abortion, if they don't see that you see them as human, if you don't treat them with that respect and treat them like they're human, worthy of dignity, then they will not see the pre-born as human. All right, you guys, we've covered a lot of ground in today's episode, and we're drawing near to an end just because um, I want to talk about some other things. I'll link that Alpha News article below about the pro-lifer who was questioned by FBI agents on Tuesday, so you guys can read that if you want. We just don't have time to cover that today. Before we leave, though, I want to give you guys some key steps, some ways to join the pro-life revolution. Here's how you become a pro-life activist tangibly, okay? Number one, get act, get educated on this issue. So go to liveaction.org, find their resources like I did as a little baby 17-year-old, read up on this issue. We also have a ton of resources for you guys. We have other podcast episodes, so we have, we'll have them linked in the description. We didn't have time to do like pro-life apologetics in this episode just because there's a lot of other things to talk about, but I have done two podcast episodes um, about that before, so I'll link that below. We have a lot of other pro-life resources for you guys, so don't hesitate to reach out. You can go ahead and email grace at mfc.org if you want more resources or if you have a question or even an argument you want me to debunk. The second thing that you should do is speak out in your schools, in your churches, and in your workplaces. Now, Easier said than done sometimes, but I'm serious. In every sphere of life that you live in, that you work in, that you breathe in, you have the opportunity to change hearts and minds. And maybe you go to a Christian school and you go to a Christian church, but I guarantee there are people there that either aren't fully convinced of the pro-life movement's message or they're just uneducated about it. So you need to speak up. You need to use your voice because the number one thing that you can do to change the narrative on this issue is speak up. Speaking up truly does change hearts and minds. And that's what I've done. I've just, I talk about this issue and I see hearts and minds change. So um, the third thing that you guys can do is you can organize a pro-life chalk day. It's a really great way to get the pro-life movement's message out. You just grab some chalk, you go onto a sidewalk and you write some life-affirming messages. And that's just a great way to show your support for the pre-born. The, third, the fourth thing, excuse me, that you can do is to start a pro-life group at your school. Now, Students for Life is a great organization that I've worked with before. I love what they do, and I've gone to their conferences, um, but they help you get started working. Um, you, they help you start a pro-life group at your school. So if you need help, you can reach out to Students for Life. Otherwise, you can also reach out to me. I'm happy to help and be a mentor for you, but I love Students for Life, and they have a lot of really cool resources for you guys. I'm pretty sure that they also send you guys like money and stuff to run event pro-life events. So that's cool. Uh, the fifth thing that you can do is utilize social media to get the word out about this human rights crisis. Now, not everyone has social media, but for those of you that do, that can be a really great way. Now, I'm not saying, okay, go ahead and get into a bunch of little fights and wars with people like in the comment sections and just have this back and forth battle. That's not really how hearts and minds are changed, but I would encourage you to post about it on your page on your stories on your feed post about it and state your position concisely and clearly but don't feel like you have to go back and forth atom and atom with the same person people usually don't change their minds in the comment section but a post can be really helpful and it can show your alliance with the pre-born and with women in need 
You can also volunteer at your local pregnancy resource center. Great way to get involved. Uh, you can go to cradleofhope.org to find the closest pregnancy resource center to you. I'll also have that linked below, but it basically is just a map and you can like, click on ones and you see which one's closest and they always need volunteers. You can organize a diaper or baby drive at, or baby clothes drive at your church. That's a great way to get involved, especially to activate your church to be involved in the pro-life movement. Number eight, you can invite me to speak about the pro-life movement at your church, at your youth group, or at your school. I would love to come talk to you guys. Uh, if you go to mfc.org, there's a little banner and it says request a speaker. You can click on that and fill it out. You can also email me, grace at mfc.org. I would be happy to come speak to you. My schedule is filling up quite a bit, especially in October, November, because I already have a ton of speaking requests from parishes, churches, local communities. They, uh, I'm really excited for all these events, but make sure if you want me to come speak to you, you get it on the calendar now because I don't have that many weekends or nights open, honestly, because there's a lot of speaking requests coming in. And honestly, when I come to speak to you, I can give a presentation that's kind of like this. In fact, right now I'm looking at some notes from a presentation that I've given. This is what I call the Engaging in the Fight for Life talk. I talk about my personal story. I talk about um, how you can get involved in the fight for life and why you should care. So it's very similar to what I've just been talking about. But I can also tailor my talk to you. I can also tailor my talk to why abortion hurts women because I think that's a really important topic. So really, I can talk about whatever you guys want within the pro-life arena. And I can just do basic pro-life apologetics back and forth too. Love doing that. So yeah, you can invite me to speak. Number nine, you can subscribe to this podcast so you can get the facts and stand for life every single week. Make sure you tell your friends about this podcast too because, guys, we tell you about so many different things on this podcast, right? All right, so those are the top main ways in which I think that you guys can get involved in the fight for life. A lot of those ways are things that I do in my life. I want to just remind you that at all costs, you and I, we are the face of this movement and you and I must keep the pressure on. We had a huge win that we saw recently, right? This summer, June, we saw Roe v. Wade, the giant of Roe, fall. It is now in the ash heap of history, praise God. But the thing is, there was a lot of momentum then and we need to keep that momentum going. We must keep that pressure on the opposition. We must never stop fighting. If we let this pressure just kind of like diff diffuse and sizzle down, we're going to lose the fight. But I know that you and I are pro-life activists. And if you're not a pro-life activist yet, you will be. Refer to this episode. Reach out to me. I will help you get the resources you need. Here's the deal. The truth is on our side and the truth will win. Life will win. The light will always win. Darkness will not prevail. We have a lot of enemies. But the fact is that God is on our side. And if God is on our side, we cannot lose. We can only win. All right, you guys, thank you so, so much for tuning in to this episode of the Family Beacon Podcast. It has been a pleasure to be here with you guys today. We've covered a lot of different things, and it was just great to talk to you about something I'm so passionate about, and I feel like I could just talk about for another hour or two, honestly. Thank you for tuning in. Remember, you can tune in every single Friday so that you can get the facts and stand for truth. I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to or watching this episode of the Family Beacon Podcast from Minnesota Family Council. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you're up to date on life, family, and religious freedom. You can follow us on Instagram at MN Family Council and subscribe to us on YouTube to watch our content. Get the facts, stand for truth. Music